In the future, we'll do something different, but, but for right now, I can't like imagine doing something without, without her. Ashley. <laughs> In recent times of the great and talented Elizabeth Olsen, it is hard to not notice the praise and switch of tone recently to her living legend sisters Mary-Kate and Ashley Olsen. This was recently brought to my attention after the 2021 Emmy Awards where Elizabeth wore a gown custom made by The Row. The Row being the household fashion brand by Mary-Kate and Ashley themselves. It was a walking Easter egg and gave many fans a piece of the satisfaction we all desire when it comes to getting any glimpse from the two girls who stole the screen every chance they got. This can be shown by the way we clung to this random ass birthday shout out to Ashley Benson. Happy birthday, Ashley. I hope this year is one of the best ones yet. We're sending Super you lots magical. of love and can't wait to meet you soon. Bye. Bye. Like, why is she so important to them? I don't know. I feel like they felt charitable that day. With the shift in climate and so many stories being told about the hardships of young starlets like Britney Spears, the Austin Twins, Amanda Bynes, Paris Hilton, and more, it forced our culture to face the reality that the world was harsh to these child stars who simply just wanted to entertain and provide for their families. Sometimes they didn't even want to do that, which is just sad. There are huge amounts of resources where you can find out about just what those hardships were, particularly for Mary-Kate who went through a lot of hardships in her teen years, I recommend a video by the YouTuber Sloan titled The Tragic Life of Mary-Kate and Ashley, and there's also a breakdown of similar topics by YouTuber Julia titled How Hollywood Damaged the Austin Twins. They both dissected perfectly, but this video is not going to focus on that at all, but more so their accomplishments and timeline of work because it is monumental and iconic. It should be celebrated. Plus, it gives me an excuse to soothe my inner child who could only dream of making this video. So today, I welcome you to the cinematic universe of Mary-Kate and Ashley Olsen. They say boys will be boys. Well, that's not overblown, because they're forever all together in a different time zone. What could be more annoying than this? Hang around them some more, and you're sure to have a big list. How about the times you think you know it's in the mind? No, you don't. You can't. You won't. That's right. Irritated, frustrated, that's how I feel. They got me going round, up and down. Just like a Ferris wheel. On June 13, 1986, in Sherman Oaks, California, first came baby girl Ashley and a few minutes later, Mary Kate. The fraternal twins were born to Father Dave, who was a mortgage banker, and Mother Jarnette, who was an ex-dancer of the Los Angeles Ballet. After mentioning she had twins to a casting agent friend and showing a picture of the two girls, it was like a shot of lightning that they were soon auditioning for a new sitcom that was in development. This sitcom was titled Full House and would be on the ABC network. This, of course, worked out perfectly with the limits of child labor laws as one twin could work and then soon be swapped with another. It also was a benefit that despite being fraternal, which I personally had no idea about, both Mary-Kate and Ashley favored one another enough that you could not spot the difference and that was even more of a benefit to the showrunners. Keep in mind they were infants. I've seen as young as nine months that they were doing this show that will later become a phenomenon. Now I suggest you watch the videos I suggested earlier in the video to know about the ethics of this because this is insane. But with me talking about their careers, it is hard not to mention what started this all, which is the Full House era. Dude. Dude. This breakdown is mainly about the Olsen movies and what they did cinematically, but it is hard to not mention their start into the industry, which so happens to be the classic hit sitcom Full House. If you watch the show, you would know the Austin's most known line. Got it, dude. <laughs> you got it, dude. <laughs> got it, dude. And just overall, them being cute as a button, playing the youngest child of the family, Michelle Tanner. Many do not know that Full House is one of the catalysts for us getting the iconic filmography from the Austin twins, and not just because it shined a spotlight on them. Well, not so much being as Full House was a grower when it came to views, most not even having it in their top 30 of top shows at the time in the late 80s, early 90s. The Austins did boost a lot of the views, and that was why the thing that ultimately always happens occurred, issues with payment. 
Now, as mentioned, the Austins were perfect for the role of Michelle Tanner as having two actors that looked the same play one allowed those pesky child labor laws to not be such an effect. But it was hard to not notice with them pulling in so many views that they were simply getting paid about $4,000 per episode, which was ultimately minimum wage according to the Screen Actors Guild at the time. Their parents, Dave and Jeanette, decided that it was time to hire an entertainment lawyer who just happened to be Robert Thorne, who had worked with the likes of Prince and Sue was able to get the Austins a higher cut. Now, I don't want to end this section without saying R.I.P. to Bob Saget. I filmed this before that, but I just wanted to say it. It's so sad. So I know you're probably thinking, why go into such behind the scenes of a show that was just the start of their career? Well, that same entertainment lawyer became their agent. And that, folks, well, <laughs> that's when we say the rest was history. For your interview. Now drop the bat. Let's go. Right, you got 10 when many of the iconic films of Mary Kay and Ashley are brought up, you can tell that most of them come from their tween slash teen years. I do have to say that I don't think it's a slight, but it is inevitable as a lot of their early films were heavy on that classic child movie aesthetic. They didn't have any type of depth or vibe that some of the later works would possess that many fell in love with, except one which I'll bring up in this section of the video later. I would actually argue most of their earlier films relied on their adorableness as young girls which is not a problem it just doesn't give me the chance to sit here and go on and on about them trying to go to their grandmother's house and getting kidnapped yeah <laughs> that's a plot with that being said it is why i've decided to group all their work from the ages of 6 to 12 in one category this weeds out all the more forgettable films that were made to jumpstart them into fame without the notice of full house and also allows us to quickly get to the more recognizable and thought out plots the austins have starred in over 36 movies together so i am sure we will have a plethora of material and be on quite a journey going through it all which brings me to the start of this whole thing. Mommy wants a vacation from us. We could go to Grandma Mimi's house for Christmas. Good idea. Let's do it. How do we get to Grandma's house? Do I have to think of everything now? Come on. With the slow fame of Full House, the Austin twins were ready to go when people like Robert Thorne and other execs discovered their talent. Instead of going straight to the big screen, a lot of their early work, the first in 1992, which was titled To Grandmother's House We Go, was either straight to TV or straight to VHS. With this deal in the works of small screen work, the two girls were able to push out more content than if they were pursuing things on a larger scale. This is not uncommon for young stars in old times. We can look to the huge amount of movies done by stars like Shirley Temple and see the formula actually works. To Grandmother's House We Go was the perfect start for the girls. It gave the recognizable, adorable nature everyone loved about them in Full House that was somehow always getting them into a bit of trouble. So let me get this straight. Now, you packed your bags, you rode your bike around the block, you hopped the bus, looked at the Princess Penny dolls, and then you snuck in the back of my truck so I'd drive you to your great grandma's house in Edgemont. You forgot we put chicken legs in a hat. Oh, right. Well, I'm guessing that your mom doesn't know anything about this. No, we're giving her a vacation. Well, she ought to be going nuts right about now wondering where the hell you two went. They played sisters Sarah and Julie Thompson, who hear their divorce and now single mothers stress about them being a handful. Stop. Girls eat your dinner, girls get in the bath, girls get out of the bath, girls go to sleep. I mean it, girls go to sleep. Every time I turn around, Sarah and Julie are into some kind of trouble. Not wanting to have her Christmas ruined, the twins decide to pack their bags and yes, just like the title, head to their grandmother's house. You can imagine with them being six years old, what problems could arise, like literal kidnapping, which does happen. They are held for ransom and then eventually their mother finesses the money to get them back. Again, as you see, there is a reason to group these earlier films together. There is not much to them and even though not many of the Alston films are full of options, Oscar worthy plot points, the younger ones are ridiculous at times. Hey, did you just drop a chicken bone in my case? There's still some meat on there. Oh, okay.
Yeah. Um, let's let's just move on. Abracadabra! Shakusi, shakusi! Ooh, ee, ooh, ah, ah! You're wasting your time, Half Pints. It's after midnight. The next standalone film from the twins comes in the year of 1993, which is also the year their lawyer-turned-agent, Robert Thorne, made the entertainment group Dual Star. This will later be evident in the movies made by the Austins, as you see the name before every star of their movies. This was a way for Thorne to guide their careers, and later on, the girls would become co-contributors slash owners of their own portion of Dual Star Media. Double Double Toy and Trouble seemed to mimic the nature of their first featured film. They play sisters Kelly and Lynn Farmer. In this movie, they go to their evil old aunt to help their parents with some money problems. When finding out their aunt is a twin, too, whose sister is trapped in a mirror in her huge mansion, they set to get the ancient moonstone holding her there and rescue her from their evil aunt. Again, very much children aesthetic, but this had way more of a plot and build than the first movie ever had. In fact, this one is in some people's Halloween rotation. Not mine personally, but the pill is there. It's a cute Halloween movie and proves the love sisters should have and blah blah blah. Let's move on. Sometimes shopping's hard work. Shopping could be hard for you. You practice so much. True, true. <laughs> well, I think the school looks great. The only thing missing are... Cute boys. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. How did she do it? As I earlier stated, Mary Kate and Ashley in the beginning of the years were pushing out straight to VHS features or straight to television movies. So when breaking down their film career, yes, there is over 36 movies to list, but most of them are a part of two huge series that they did up until their early teen years. Both of these series are where we get most of our hilarious dance break memes. <laughs> Sorry, I just, it, it's crazy how that fits in with everything, but it, it, it's a gem. Though they were acting, these two series made the world that was Mary-Kate and Ashley feel as if they were your friend or you were watching them grow up because you were a part of these big moments of their acted life. Better idea. Let's eat on the way. It was as if they were giving lifestyle even though it wasn't really their life. It is amazing to look and see that most of these films were three or even four times a year. When I say they did not rest, it is not a joke. I would be insane to sit here and break down some of these films because they are ridiculous, but I will list them off as the two series were meant to surround two different things. The Adventures of Mary-Kate and Ashley included The Case of Laga Cali Ranch, The Case of Thor Mansion, The Case of the Christmas Caper, The Case of the Sea World Adventures, The Case of the Mystery Cruise, The Case of the Hotel Whodunit, The Case of the Shark Encounter, The Case of the U.S. Space Camp, The Case of the Volcano Mystery, The Case of the United States Navy Adventure, and The Case of the Fun House Mystery. <laughs> As you can see, there was a lot. This specific series had the word case in the titles because these were described as youth detective series where they solved certain problems. Yeah. The You're Invited To series is a little less complicated. It's more so phases in life that you as the audience can get a peek into, inviting people to sleepovers, Hawaiian beach parties, Christmas parties, mall parties, ballet parties, camp out parties, fashion parties, costume parties, school dance parties, and you can't forget the average birthday party. This is the series where I can most see where a connection or cult-like following can occur, being as even though this was an acting job, most of their audience who were on the younger side would gather this as this was really Mary Kate and Ashley and really their personalities. They probably felt like they could do these things with them, which with all the parties they were invited to, how could you blame them? Both of these series total to over 20 in the span of the years of them being six to early teens. I can only imagine how much it must have been to record so many to be working so hard at a young age. There were two feature films throughout the run of both of their series. Oh, and a rare and a Mary-Kate and Ashley home video, which I don't know is worth mentioning, but it's there. Let me tell you something. This ranch ain't big enough for the three of us. The dream. What? We're staying, and we're gonna help save the ranch. 
In this film, the twins play sisters Jessica and Susie Martin, who received a message from their deceased mother to travel to some exotic dude ranch. After losing his job, their widowed dad decides to take them up on the offer and discovers that there's a case of gentrification on the rise. The villain of the movie seeks to turn the native ranch into an amusement park, which of course these bright white saviors cannot dare to let happen. Which, for the early 90s, can be seen as progressive, but so wrong, and just me saying that sentence makes me want to go cry in the corner. It's filled with white savior complex, more kidnapping, and twin magic, so just no but it is a part of their film history. This, in my opinion, is the best of young Mary-Kate and Ashley films. In fact, I watched this movie so much as a kid, I am surprised the tape didn't break. It can also be seen as their first really big film as it had box office success. The girls play Alyssa Calloway and Amanda Lemon, one being a rich girl and the other being an orphan who just can't seem to find a foster home. In some strange way, they end up bumping into one another and the next thing you know, they discover they are weirdly identical but not related somehow. Despite logic, it is a feel-good film, and in the world of parent traps, it is hard to not love a film like this. Plus, it has prime Kirstie Alley in it. Don't even get me started on how gorgeous she looks. I mean, the water scene in the lake, are you, like, are you kidding me? This is the first film that I think you cannot deny the talent that these two girls had. The comedic timing, the cuteness, but quirkiness, and just the way they knew how to work the cameras. It was amazing to see, and to me, this is a classic. Personal ad on a billboard? The whole city would see it. This is the shift of the Mary Kate and Ashley universe for me, and I'm pretty sure it anyone who has ever encountered their work. In this film, they play Tess and Emily Tyler, who has a dad who can't find someone to save his life. They, of course, in their pesky twin trope ways, decide to put a billboard out to find him one. This is the formula that was formed when it came to the rest of their cinematic careers. Twins with an inconvenience in life, making trouble to fix it while wearing very fashionable outfits and being boy crazy. It's nothing crazy, but the delivery is there. And with all that work on their target audience feeling a connection, they were ready to eat it up every time, which includes me. I will put this down as the official tone shift of their work, which was what was needed with all the kidnapping and cultural appropriation happening, even though they continue to deal with being kidnapped and dealing with cultural appropriation. Look, they're not perfect. Why doesn't anybody want to hear about my predictions? I don't know, Mom. But I predict that Dad will never choose me to be on his team. This is what I consider the perfect blend of the younger films done by Mary-Kate and Ashley and the aesthetic we see in later films. Playing Sam and Emma Stanwell, they play in the good old trope that they usually do. Sporty and not so sporty, but somehow talented at it in the end. It probably has less depth than all their later films because they literally just get put on Switch soccer teams. Instead of just saying who they were, they decided to stay switched and end up getting caught. Essentially, they both stay playing soccer but just different positions. It's not their best work. The last few films on this list is where things start to get more noticeable as far as the Austin Twins brand filmatically. The series they have done, the movies in between those series, seem to be meant to push themselves out there and take advantage of the things that got them higher on the fame scale in the first place. Adorable twin mechanisms and catchphrases. But now, in the next era, we are about to examine they found a new pocket, with them being older in age. Tween angst. We did it. Get out of here with your bad man, Mendoza. Look, they're coming. Remember the true test. Yep, can they tell us apart? If not, what's my team? Passport to Paris represents the privilege I never dreamed I could have at a young age, but somehow represented the aesthetic I knew I could achieve if life was fair. Which, of course, it isn't. With that being said, Melanie and Alice and Porter are insanely boy crazy. In fact, they are so boy crazy that they would rather do anything but go to Paris for spring break with their grandfather, who is the ambassador of Paris. 
I'm not even exaggerating. Like that's that's the real plot. Of course, it's filled with amazing tween fashion, insanely cute, but also age questionable French boys, and they do everything to see those French boys from sneaking out and away from their security to secret dates where they're doing a bit too much for my now adult eyes. I wish you did not have to leave tomorrow. They may not have been able to go to the spring fling dance, but they had stories to bring back and realized in the end, you have flings with older French boys and find some kindness in your grumpy old grandpa by sharing McDonald's fries. With all the insanity of it, this is where the legendary acts begin. In this movie, it is clear the Olsen twins found their pocket. Not only was there the fashion that they are known for, which I can make a whole video about that alone and how the resurgence is insane with trends of today, but also you had that essence of what is on almost every young person's mind. Boys, dances, and doing insane things to have that be the only thing that matters. You call this under control? You look like Crocodile Dundee. <laughs> well, look on the bright side. At least everyone speaks English. This is my favorite Mary Kate and Ashley movie overall. Not only is it peak formula for what the twins are known for, it has the best storyline and makes it feel less straight to video and more box office. It wasn't just honed in on the tween angst, but it involved the adults to where it wasn't so obsessive and it was a great cause that all of them were fighting towards. It had nothing to do with the classic twin magic, which can sometimes have you roll your eyes. I mean, it was some of it, but it definitely wasn't as heavily relied on as in other films. The actors in it also weren't bad and had great timing. I am obsessed with the mom in it. I'm out here, honey. <laughs> there you are. Oh. Happy anniversary. Sweetheart. Oh, they're beautiful. <gasps> Honey. Let's get more into the movie and less about how much I'm obsessed with it. In this film, the girls play Maddie and Abby Parker, opening up with an amazing getting ready scene with epic 2000s music. We love a classic intro. We are shown their journey into their first day of high school where things don't go so well. Instead of a smooth first day, they are witnesses to a diamond heist. Honestly, I think the director and workers deserve an award for the catch-up scene alone. With the mafia sure to be on their back after testifying to what they saw, it was no doubt that they would be after the Parkers. So so they are put into witness protection program. There is only one problem though. They can't keep their mouth shut. They go through identity after identity until finally they have one last resort, the last place on earth, which is a setup in Sydney, Australia. They are set up to where they are kids of parents who own a bed and breakfast. The criminals eventually find them in their new life and we of course can't have a full story without some cute boys and bullies and before they knew it, the mysteries were solved. This is out of all their films before the last one that I would recommend. It's a full film that feels as if you took a journey instead of simply being a vlog of a tween's life and it also ends with a huge beach scene and and cute little quirky lines about what happened in the movie it's it's just really this is the one this is the one we have a surprise for you you work very hard at school very proud of you and so we thought it was time you had uh, your own suite In all the Why next few movies I mentioned, this is probably the least favorable to me. In this film, they play Madison Brittany and Alex Stewart. It is fully based around a resort, specifically the Atlantis Resort, which is not short on all of the promotion they have throughout the film. After getting pulled to the Bahamas for spring break, instead of going to the Hawaii vacation they wanted to with their friends, they are forced to enjoy the fruits and suns of the Bahamas. Honestly, it's like a glorified, non-violent version of a Far Cry video game, and despite many of their movies being surface level, this has to be the most surface level movie I believe they have ever made in the era we are discussing. The main problem was that they didn't want to be there, and in result, they realized that the tropical getaway isn't so bad, no matter who the hell it's with, especially your family, because it's a tropical getaway. Anyway, cute boys, jet skis, and blah blah. The only savior of this movie, in all honesty, is Megan Fox, which, <laughs> congrats on the engagement. But soft, what light through yonder window breaks? It is the east and Juliet. 
is the sun. He is so cute. Now, many would argue that this is a mid Austin movie, but in no way do I agree. I believe this was their first attempt at that serious but rom com type style movie that we will see later perfected in their last film, New York Minute. Also, it is no denying that the fits in this movie are insane. Like, I want it all in my closet, and the more muted tone of things makes you focus on what's happening in the movie much more than ever before. Here, they play sisters Chloe and Riley Lawrence, who are complete opposites of course this time making one serious and goal focused which strangely was played by mary kate this time which normally would be ashley's role who instead plays the dizzy good timed one when one of the members of the smart ones debate team drops out they recruit her less caring sister to travel to london for the festivities of a un international competition when they got there though the big problem of it all is that their country which they normally represent china is taken and they have to represent London. Not knowing much about the country, they decide to take on the London streets and learn everything they need to know about it. All while falling in love, of course, with a nobleman and a friend from back home. Overall, it's a great gag on what they need to solve and I just, I'm obsessed with the look of it. I think that this is the same old formula that they normally used in, you know, this new era that we're examining, but it works. That's a beautiful oh cake, Mr. and Mrs. Hunter. It's a work of art. Thank you. Happy birthday! Now, this one is for the archives. I'm just mentioning it because, honestly, we're going to show their whole entire filmography and this is a part of it. It focuses on Taylor and Kyler Hunter who are basically going on a road trip after the excitement of being able to drive. Of course they go through all of the pop-up problems like they normally do and even get their car stolen. It can honestly be grouped into one of those little series of movies that they did when they were younger just a bit more produced. It's, it's literally a movie about being able to drive and being on the road now. It's, it's it's not much, but it's a part of their filmography. Do you think they'll let us work on a fashion shoot? You will spend the summer working in our mailroom. No jokes, no playing around. As we go on in films, I think it is clear to see where the Austin twins were heading as far as film style. It is much more winning London than our lips are sealed. When in Rome is all about Layla and Charlie Hunter, who in all of my childhood glory were fashion interns who aren't the best at their job. Now, is there much I can say about the film? No, but in my selfish fashion student heart, this is up there for me. A problem arises when a couture item is missing and they have to do everything to get it back. And of course, there are cute boys involved. Another passerby, but it's focused on what I love, fashion, so I have no problems with it. And of course, the dreaded Christmas fruit cake. Can't do this. I'm a vegetarian. Well, you should have thought of that before you decided to come on. Yo, ladies, do we need a time out here? No. Now, when talking about Mary Kate and Ashley movies, I find this one is brought up a lot more than the earlier versions of the films. Most of that, I believe, has to do with accessibility. Many of their movies were straight to video or DVD, and in the New Age times, I remember personally, since the challenge was later in the years, you could watch it easily on YouTube. Not saying it was legal, but you could. This is actually their final direct-to-video movie, and they kind of threw out all the stunts on this one. In the movie, they play Shane and Elizabeth Dalton. One is a hippie, and the other is a student who, as you can guess, everybody say it with me, serious and goal-oriented. They are children of divorce, and the problem arises when they, as sisters who don't talk, one living with the dad, one living with the mom, all comes to a head when they both sign up for a Survivor Challenge show. They have to team up together, by the end of the film and honestly with it being a send-off movie for them I can't deny it has some weight. It literally has all the elements that we love of the girls. A dash of cute boys, twin magic, fashion, angst. The recipe is complete. You can't sit here right now. I need quiet. Chill! You won't even know I'm here. Listen, I am this close to winning the McGill Fellowship. I've worked my whole life for this. Here we are, the last time we see the Austin twins on film together and the holy grail of their filmography in my eyes. Think of us taking all the elements of the films we just discussed, diluting them down to a slight action comedy, and we have the classic New York Minute. 
Never, ever Hello. touch my day planner. Okay, you need to chill on the nerd book, okay? This was also the last release for their co-owned media company, Dual Star. This was an important film being as it featured the girls right before they turned 18 and it was sort of like their last gift to the fans that they wanted to give before the retirement. Okay, puppy. Okay. Go home. You need to go. go home. What are you doing? We need to go. No, we need that dog. That dog is my life and when he poops, his poop is my life. Now, it wouldn't be our girls if they weren't tropes. In this film, they took on the roles of Jane, the hot nerd who has everything riding on her goals for the future, and of course, the misfit, Roxy, who does everything but go to school and wouldn't be caught dead following any type of rules. They obviously have a rivalry going on as siblings and a lot of hurt that they are trying to live through being as their mom passed away. This film gives us a preview of what an awesome movie with them older would look like on a bigger scale. I think you can't deny the timing they had with one another or just how much they worked their cameras and even their quirks. This movie showed off their best attributes and what they learned over the years. It makes it okay as a fan with it being their last film to be honest. This was also a theater release and despite it being what many may describe as typical Austin movies, it made over 14 million dollars in the U.S. box office and 23.4 million overall with a 30 million dollar budget. Despite Despite the blatant cultural appropriation scene and just bad stereotypes overall scene, you know that scene, it showed on a bigger level what they could have took the brand to if they continued to make movies. But honestly, after working for so many years and having so many triumphs as kids with no breaks, it was okay that they didn't take it any further. So there it is, the cinematic universe of Mary-Kate and Ashley Olsen, the girls who started working on TV and film when they were simply nine months old and up until they were young adults. With all the slight praise that I see, I found it hard to not make this the first video I posted on this channel as it is meant to be a channel filled with all the things that I love. And this is simply just their film career, the things that they did film-wise and in TV, but to look back and see not only were they producing all of these films and some of this tv stuff but they were a franchise like they literally had toys and games and devices it was more than them it literally became an entity and every opinion that i have they have every right to stand on streets and smoke cigarettes and tote hobo bags because they did a lot there were such key points to me discovering things that I liked about myself when I was younger with all the shit they went through. It's just, it's important to tell them this now and give them the flowers. They had an amazing career. Even if you think the movies are not good, you can't deny their impact and you also can't deny how much they are hard workers. Anyways, I hope you enjoy our first episode of this series. I plan to include people like Raven Simone, Lindsay Lohan, Hilary Dovehill. I might go up a notch and dive into the actresses I feel just don't get enough love, even on the bigger spectrum like Anne Hathaway. I have so much planned for the future and would love to hear what you want to see next. Until then, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.